Okay. Interesting question here. Can a book save a wilderness? Uh, it's a uh, perfect topic for the people we're about to bring up here to talk about it. Uh, <clears throat> Rick Bass is going to start. You already heard from him. He's going to uh, talk about the uh, topic of art and activism. And that's to be followed with a roundtable discussion with Rick, Terry Tempest Williams, Doug Peacock, and if you weren't here yesterday, a new face, Shane Doyle. Uh, yeah, if you were here yesterday, that's what you feel like yelling out. Shane is superb. Uh, he's an enrolled member of the Crow Tribe, a native musician, uh, an environmental advocate who works as a collaborative liaison between groups like Montana Wilderness Association or Montana Wild, the U.S. Forest Service, and the Crow Nation. Uh, Rob Cheney, who is the managing director of the Missoulian, is going to moderate this discussion. So we'll start with Rick Bass coming out, and uh, we'll move this thing out of the way so these folks can have a, a good conversation and you can see them. It's all yours. What did I do? <laughs> Thank you, Tracy, for uh, what you've done for Montana and what you're doing for the United States and, and, uh, and beyond. Uh, just no end to the magic you can, you can bring. Uh, every time I drive along the Clark Fork and, Clark Fork and the Blackfoot, it's like, uh, that river used not to be there. And uh, it's, it's, it's what's best about our species. Thinking of, it's kind of a clumsy compliment, you know, Tracy. You're a, you're a testament to your species. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what I mean. <clears throat> it's like Noah's Ark up here, biblical, a refuge. Nothing's gone extinct, despite the previous administration's attempts otherwise. So there are more connections up here. We don't understand them but we feel comforted in their midst. Even in a time of war, we feel safe. I was afraid it wasn't going to go away. <laughs> it was the year of the great dying, and we went into the forest as if summoned, listening. We'd received a letter from the government saying the old forest was going to be cut down to make it more resilient, to teach it manners. We wandered. We walked softly on emerald mosses. We didn't look up much. You can't see all that's above, only below. We lay down on the moss and slept. We dreamed. We woke. Heaven is beneath our feet as well as above. There no longer is any metaphor. For a week or so, all our roads are covered in gold. Our streets are lined with gold, here and now. We saw the light coming down as a miracle. The waves of light are no different than waves of music. In the old forest, time behaves differently. It seems to us to have stopped. What is rot but slow fire? The light started toward us long ago. Thank you. Thank you, God. <laughs> the light started toward us long ago. It's only now finding us. In this old forest, you can hear the light. In olden times, when a person went mad, they'd be tied to a tree beside a rushing river and listen to it until they healed. The giants in here grow out of the hearts of fallen giants, which grew out of the hearts of the giants before them. This place is a carbon miracle. It holds the carbon in safekeeping through the centuries. What is old growth? This forest is so old it doesn't even show up on the Forest Service's charts. They can't see it. 
their eyes are blinded. In my father's mansion there are many rooms, says one prophet. I would not have made such a place without you in mind. A tree without a forest is not a tree. The tree without a forest will die. Sun scald, wind shear, grief. Our grief is not the only grief in the world. All things are connected. Water and light equals life. Water, light, life, and earth equals rot. Water, life, light, and rot equals soil. Water and light equals music. Nature abhors a straight line. There is always music in the soil. There is always music being created in the wood. When you touch the wood, you can feel it like sunlight before you can hear it, before it comes out. We went into the ruination and salvaged one vertebrae of ancient spruce to make the perfect guitar. On it, our country's greatest musicians will play songs of resistance and hope. From it, the old forest will speak. The old forest will sing. The guitar has been silent all these centuries. We want a guitar that will defend the old forest. We selected the wood that held the music we needed. We want a miracle. We will work for a miracle. These photos are from Brad Orsted, a Save the Yellowstone Grizzly champ. What is time but the fundament of miracles? If we were to walk into a frozen field in late March and be told those who slept beneath our feet as if dead would return, would we not call that a miracle? Thank you. Winters are still long in the yak. Winter to spring, breath to breath. If it happens fast, we call it a miracle. If it takes centuries, we don't see it. And here we are in the middle, unseeing and unhearing. We are not the only ones who love black ram. Are we the crop or the gardener? This is only our first day in the garden. Everything we see, touch, taste, smell, hear is a miracle. Here but for an eye blink. They aerate the soil with daggered claws. Lilies grow where they walk. They roll boulders aside and life emerges. They lick the ants like sprinkles on ice cream. They scratch the soil and wildness rushes out, greeting the light with all of us in the middle. The yaks, frogs, and salamanders need black ram too. There are only three mother grizzlies with cubs left. There must be two of everything, one story reminds us. Our hearts remind us. What is a miracle, really? In the old forest, our relationship with time changes. The old forest tells us, slow down. We're all but a blink. We all sip from the headwaters in which sparkle flecks of gold, so that we are made of gold. W.S. Merwin wrote, I want to tell what the forests are like. I will have to speak in a forgotten language. It was the year of the great dying. We went into the old forest to sleep and into the old forest to awaken. Listen, listen harder. <clears throat> Thank you all. I, I want to um, 
ask for your help with what's going on up in the Yak. We've been defending this old forest. Uh, and I really started with, with Dick Manning uh, being over at his and Tracy's house. Uh, Dick written incredible books about everything in the world, including music. And he went around into his studio to get a new guitar that he had secured. And he handed it to me. And I'm deaf and not a musician, and I don't know quality from, you know, as they say, from Shinola. And, and I reached out to hold it. And it was like somebody handing a, an infant to you. And, and when I touched it, just the, the skin, the tightness, the sound that resonance that came from this, it was like a ship, like a, you know, a, it was just, it was just beautiful. I, I, oh man, I hope none of my writing students are here. You're not supposed to say a thing is beautiful, you're supposed to show it's beautiful. Um, it had a black starburst pattern and, and gold maple tiger stripes, but the top was old spruce, very tight grain old spruce. It's made by Kevin Kopp, who used to work for Gibson, and, and uh, now he started his own high-end uh, guitar companies, Master Luthier, and he likes the old spruce from Yak. When there's a, a you know, spruce will blow across a road or something, he'll go in and pull out a, a piece of that really tight grain, slow-growing, uh, magical, oh, show, don't tell. <laughs> um, it's really special. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, we've been fighting this, this black ram forest and the, the proposed timber sale, 60 million board feet, named, uh, in, in, in the name of fuels reduction. It's 40 miles from the nearest incorporated town. It's up in an alpine swamp. It's on the Canadian border. Uh, it's, it's, it's downwind. I mean, no fire is gonna run 40 miles down against the wind into, the, into town. It's, it's just a timber grab. It came out of the previous administration's executive order to increase volume by 40% and do away with environmental impact statements. Three mother female grizzlies with cubs in the Yak Valley, and there's not an EIS on nearly, now it's adding up to almost 400,000 acres of, of just no EIS, just increasing the volume. Um, and as we are learning, our science is trying to keep up, the, these giant trees can hold, they not can, can hold, they do hold the most carbon in the forest. One the top 1% of the trees, the largest 1% can hold up to 50% of the carbon in the forest. It is, uh, it's climate treason to be cutting these trees that are centu many centuries old, 300, 400, 500, 600, 800 years old, uh, or, or killing them by leaving one per acre remnant which will die immediately. They have already bulldozed, the Forest Service is on, it's just, a, there's no word for it. Like Tracy said, there are career individuals who work for the government and put up with the worst kind of, of abuse, verbal abuse for, uh, for wearing their uniform. But where I live, it's gone rogue. And not everybody up there is rogue, but leadership is rogue. And I mean, they bulldoze through wetlands to get to this forest. They've painted 20 foot high stripes on the trees they're gonna cut, on the trees they're gonna leave, the, the one per acre of these 800 year old larch it's, it's madness up there. It's, it, again, it's climate treason. And um, we're going to court like we always do. I hope that they lose like they always do on the Kootenai. But it's, uh, it would be nice to not have to go to court and continue wasting government money winning. Uh, it's wrong. We want the Black Ram uh, area to be the first in a, in a climate refuge, a curtain of green all along the northern tier of the United States securing the old prote permanent protection of old growth up in Tongass and increasing it to its historic range of variability. The North Cascades, the Selkirks in Idaho, Black Ram and the Yak, the glacier of course. Up to 50% of, of the Yak was originally old growth and now it's less than 10%. Uh, we want to bring it back up in this refuge and absorb, uh, you know, store the carbon that we need to store to mitigate climate change so we can still have grizzlies and still have salamanders. Um, across the Dakotas, we may need to plant some trees there. Uh, and then into, into, into Minnesota, the Boundary Waters, and into, into the Upper Peninsula, Michigan and Wisconsin, into the Adirondacks, in, into the, the Northeast Kingdom in Vermont, into the White Mountains of New Hampshire, into uh, Maine's North Woods. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be quick. Uh, it's going to begin in Montana. It's going to begin with y'all and telling this, the delegation to support 
the Biden administration's efforts to keep the carbon <clears throat> in the ground in the old trees. Um, Terry has this incredible story about working with, with Southern Utah wilderness advocates on, a, on a, a Red Rock wilderness proposal, and they, they made it big, and they made it wild, and they worked hard, and it was, it was hard work, and the, the collaboration and such. And they took it out to California to show Wallace Stegner, and Terry, uh, uh, you know, thank you for letting me share this story. Uh, actually, you didn't tell me I could, but um, I don't, <laughs> is, I guess, I don't, um, yeah, I'll ask forgiveness, plead forgiveness, however that goes. So they go out with this great big map, and, and Stegner looked at it, and, and, and they were expecting, you know, well done, you know, young people. And, uh, and he said, that's it, that's all. And, and, and so, uh, I mean, I, I've moved past the wilderness defense model up in the Yak. I used to fa fight and scrap for 6,000 acres, and, and as I think everybody's alluding to here, it, it, all of a sudden it's too small because of the recreational footprint that is attracted to it. And so this will be 265,000 acre climate refuge, and um, I'm already hearing Stegner and Doug and Terry saying it's too small, but it, but it is a start. And, uh, Thank you all for making it happen. I'm not letting Rick leave because we're about to start a, uh, which should be a formidable round table discussion with Rick, Terry Tempest Williams, Doug Peacock, and Shane Doyle. Uh, I don't need to reintroduce Shane Doyle. Uh, so come on out, guys. So this is Rob Cheney in the middle here. Well, semi-middle. He'll be moderating. He will uh, has a few words to kick it off with and then uh, let it rip. That's right. I was I was supposed to do that. So, thank you all so much for coming here. If I could just see a quick show of hands, um, how many folks in the room are book lovers? Okay, keep your hands up. And second question. How many of you love the outdoors? Raise your other hand. Okay, thank you. You have just given a round of applause in the deaf community to books about the outdoors. And I hope you've also reestablished a little bit of circulation for sitting and respecting all of these folks who have been providing all of this wisdom. What we want to talk about for a few minutes here is whether or not a book can save wilderness. And when we saw this topic come up, the first thing that came to my mind as a journalist, a career journalist, whose uh, job is to write the first draft of history and write it as fast as you can, that writing a book in these incredibly accelerated times might be a waste of effort. We've all heard in uh, the last year or so a number of books coming out about the recent events in Washington and revelations of things that were going on in the White House and why didn't you tell us that back four years ago? Why did you save it for your book? Right now, uh, not that you have to give a show of hands, but I'll bet there are a few people in the room here who were expecting to do a little wolf watching this summer. No, you're not. We broke Yellowstone last week. I can't get reporters into Yellowstone. You are definitely not going if you wanted to go see the Lamar Valley for a while. I am sharing the stage with some of my mentors. You all remember yesterday Tim Egan talking about when he is stuck, he pulls a copy of The River Runs Through It out, thumbs through it, and undoes his cork. These are all people that I have spent my career pulling out of a back pocket in desperate need of inspiration. I am sure all of you 
have got a book on the shelf, whether it's Rachel Carlson or Aldo Leopold or the Bible or what have you that you reach to when you're trying to figure out how to deal with these incredibly changing times. Do we have time now for more books? One other thing that I have to give you all credit for is that you have in your wisdom stolen a bunch of the questions that I had hoped to ask these folks. <laughs> so we're gonna make it up a little bit on the fly here and I'm gonna sit down and start asking a few questions and see what they've got to say. And the first question that I wanted to direct is to our good friend Shane here. Yesterday, uh, Rosalind Lapierre was talking about, not in so many words, paying for knowledge. That when you went to somebody wise and you asked them for education, you asked them for knowledge, there was an exchange expected. We are all book writers. We've got a stack of books back there. We are expecting uh, paper for paper or plastic for paper. <laughs> in return for the knowledge that we compiled there. Traditional ecological knowledge has had that same kind of exchange, and I don't want to make this into a capitalist thing, but we raised some really interesting questions yesterday. If we need to look to new sources of knowledge, old sources of knowledge that the, that the general community is unfamiliar with, do you have some thoughts about what would be an appropriate currency of exchange? Well, he just popped this on me. Uh, <laughs> it's a good question, you know. Uh, it comes up a lot, I think, for myself. Um, I'm not sure. There's a lot of different ways of thinking about it and looking at it. Every circumstance is unique. Uh, a lot of the knowledge that Native people typically share is community owned. It's owned by the community. Um, so I think there's an expectation that people who are able to benefit from the community knowledge will somehow contribute to the community. But Native people don't, um, you know, market the way Bitcoin is. Uh, marketed in terms of uh, the scale of going up and down. I don't know. It's it's a weird thing to think about. I think historically speaking, if you went to a medicine man or someone who you wanted to help you with, you know, you gave them traditional things that were not of much material value, honestly. Um, you know, maybe some bear root or cedar, or maybe maybe something else. You know. Um, I can tell you today, native artists who make who do beadwork uh, expect prices for their beadwork and their art, and just like Kevin Redstar as a painter expects to get painted. I, but those are unique individual expressions. Um, so I don't know really honestly how to answer. I don't think it's a, a good comparison. It's apples to oranges. Um, I think if there's a native author out there like Deborah Magpie Erling or someone like that who's writing, you know, books, then they should get the same price that any other author is. Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I was raised on the reservation as a, you know, member of the Crow Nation, but I'm also a member of the United States as well. And I was raised in the 20th century, not the 19th. Um, I consumed most of the same stuff I was telling someone the other day. You know, I watched so much TV, there was nothing about white people I didn't know by the time I was 10 years old. <laughs> um, so it's hard for me to separate and, you know, divide out this is the native part here and this is the white part here. And I know it's convenient to speak about it that way, but honestly, that's not the reality of the situation that most of us live in. So, uh, and I'm not 100% pure anything, except for maybe, you know, Montana, whatever that is. Um, so, how about that for an answer? 
Put that in your book. <laughs> Rick, um, in, in, to, just to argue against my own case of how long it takes to, to write a book that may change the world. A few years ago, we had an episode that was known as the Megalodes, where uh, we were uh, considering bringing gigantic uh, pieces of equipment up the uh, Columbia River to Lewistown, Idaho, and then trucking them over the mountains uh, and right through the middle of Missoula up to over the uh, Continental Divide and to the tar sands of Alberta. And in what I think may be a world record setting time, uh, you and a collaborator managed to distill your feelings about that into a novel and get it published and out into the public conversation. Considering what you've done with your other books, how long it's taken to gestate them and make them into the things that you wanted, was that something that you would try again or that you learned a lesson from? Shane, I'm not sure that I drew lucky here. I was chuckling, ah, Shane got the hard one, but uh, <laughs> I think it may, yeah. Um, I would do it again if I thought it'd be effective. Uh, you know, and, and I think the, it's hard to go back. I mean, it's, it's also hard to celebrate. Yeah, the, the, the megalos didn't come through Missoula, but, but the tar sands are still going to, to Asia. Um, I, uh, I think of that book as having a thread of, a, of an idea in it. I don't think of it as a book. I think of it as a, of a, a way to transfer information, whether, you know, whether in, in, a, in a song, in, in a painting. I mean, Monty Dolak's going to come up and paint a, the, the climate refuge up there. And I think about Russell Chatham's, you know, big paintings as being art. Uh, and, and those things take, take longer than a, than a short little novel, or novella, whatever. But what I wanted to put in that was uh, some colorful, pretty things, and then just this thread of an idea that, um, it's funny, the word threat and thread being so close here, um, to remind the, the governor at the time that uh, we, could, we, could, we, could, we could mess things up, that, that we were unpredictable and, and therefore uh, an unbeholden to, to Exxon or to, or to anybody, and that in Montana, there's this incredibly powerful de uh, democratic tool of, of the initiative, and we could we could require if if he gave the permit to Exxon to come through there, well, go ahead and get your permit. But but you know we can also pass a citizens in initiative to um, uh, you know paint pink swastikas on the side of their trailers and, and pay seventy five thousand dollars per per tenth of a mile on on you know on county roads. I mean we could we could say anything and, and pass anything, and that's what corporations don't like. They don't mind losing money, but they don't like what they hate is uncertainty, and they weren't really sure if Montana would pass an initiative or not, and, and that just getting that idea in there. So, so I just put it in the novel, novella, like a Trojan horse, you know. Uh, so it's kind of a weird answer to a, a no disrespect, but a, yeah, the question. Yeah, I would do it again. Do you, just to follow up, um, when, you, when you think about how much craft you put into your words, you do. <laughs> no? No, I'm not disagreeing. Like, um, <clears throat> can, can you work at the tempo that you think you need to now to save the black ram? when I can't even break a reporter loose to get up there because I'm so overwhelmed. No, no, I mean, I, I can't. And it's all, it comes back to storytelling. I mean, I try and write craft, beauty, because, uh, because it's what I, what I love. It's what, I, you know, birds sing, you know, writers write, yeah. Um, but, but uh, yeah, we have to pick priorities. You've got family, relationships, uh, home and art, 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 yeah, art, art is slow, art is slow, um, yeah, uh, everybody does, we do our best, yeah. All right, Doug, um, 
just before we got started on this, you made the offhand comment, uh, probably quoting, that one brave act is worth a thousand books. Uh, I don't think this thing works. Yeah. <clears throat> or I'll just hand you this one. Um, you, you've spent a lifetime on the front lines doing physical action for what you believed in. You have also put together books that everybody in this room, I suspect, has depended upon. How do you want to do it? Uh, I think that was Ed Abbey maybe 30, 40 years ago that said, and he, he, he could exaggerate a little bit, you know. <laughs> But one brave act, Douglas, is worth a thousand books. And, you know, I used to get paid for taking pictures, and they said, Douglas, one good book is worth a thousand pictures, you know. So I don't know where to take I have never probably believed the proposition that, uh, that we can save things. I think when we strive to write a book, and it doesn't matter if it's fact or fiction, you know, we... we we, we do our best and we submit ourselves to the judgment of the times. We should be judged on the basis of a, a, a work of art, if that's, you know, your standard of measure. Uh, I, I can't believe that uh, my books have met that much, except from individuals that have come up to me and, you know, told me about reading Grizzly years when they were, you know, young or a veteran reading, walking it off, you know, because it's a book very much about collective wounds of war. Those things are really important to me, and, and I weave them together when I, when I write a book, but I've never imagined myself saving anything as worry as a wilderness, you know, and, and the way I approach everything, including grizzly bears, but it's a sense of reciprocity that I find fairest to living and dealing with things, you know, beyond yourselves, your ego, and your culture. And, uh, you know, those bears did maybe save my life like I wrote once. And, uh, you know, the notion of payback, which is kind of a marine concept from Vietnam, if somebody does something for you, you find a way to pay them back. And, you know, I've been doing that for the last four or five decades. All right. Terry? Uh, j I'm sorry, can I Go ahead. say something real, really quick? Yeah, rethinking about books. I mean, you've got so many ideas in that book that have changed, has changed uh, the West and, and the state of Montana. Back before your book, people didn't think grizzlies were social. They just thought they were rogue loners. And, and uh, they didn't, that you brought the idea of wild country being healing back into a new generation, a new culture. Uh, so many, it's such literature of the resistance. That book is, I, I, I I assign it to every student I ever teach. I didn't know that. <laughs> I just um, promised this man that gave me a ride to the drugstore. It, he turns out he's a vet, and I owe him one of your books, and he was really excited. <coughs> so they're like passing letters. <coughs> Terry, you write so evocatively about spiritual experiences. And one of the things that I have been struggling with in the whole public land sacred spaces debate is the demographic trend that we're seeing around the planet of urbanization, where right now something like 80% of the world's humanity is on a sidewalk, is in an urban core, and not in the places that we've been talking about. You are spending time between your wide open spaces and Harvard Yard, uh, just down the road from Thoreau's Walden Pond, which is surrounded by houses. It is not exactly a place of isolation. How would you propose a sacrament or some other way of allowing, helping these urbanized people who do not have the ability to come out and experience an open, sacred public space, 
to get some level of the appreciation that you think that they are trying to provide? Well, I can tell you I'm learning a lot from having lived in the East for the last five years, so I'm not sure I have... To me, it's not about sacrament, it's about translation on both sides, because there are beautiful places back East. I mean, I've fallen in love with trees. I didn't know trees that were that tall, you know, or to live in a deciduous landscape. Um, I think it's, people back at, it's been my experience at Harvard that very few people know what public lands are, including at the Kennedy School, and that's been a shock to me. Um, my students don't understand public lands, and my students don't have a lot of experience uh, in the West, except for the, you know, when you have Western students. I want to give a quick example. Um, I teach at the Harvard Divinity School, and my classroom is the Emerson Chapel. And it's where Ralph Waldo Emerson gave his incendiary talk of 1838, um, and basically said to six Divinity School students with a handful of ministers and some faculty, your God is too small. And he was banned from Harvard for 30 years until Harvard looked stupid, and so they brought him back and <laughs> named a hall after him. But one of my students, we were reading that speech, which is so powerful from my perspective, and one of my students said, blah, 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 it's just another white man talking. And I realized how important the context was that at that time, Emerson had just written a letter to, I believe it was Van Buren, that in opposition to the Trail of Tears, in terms of the United States government uh, treatment of, of Native people, the Cherokees in particular, that he was an abolitionist, you know, that, so that there is this social context. And then I said to my students, and someone said, I'm so glad, because who doesn't know that God, that their God is too small? But that's because we've evolved together. And so my assignment to the students was, your assignment is to write a speech that would get you banned from Harvard for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> and things shifted. And we ended up going to Walden and you know, I think it's expanding our experiences. My life has been expanded because of a place that accepted me, because my own alma mater did not. So I'm grateful to have a place. Um, and I can't be critical as much as appreciative and that I'm learning a great deal about the other part of the country that I've been critical of. And that includes urban landscapes that are also wild. I've been living among turkeys. <laughs> there are a lot of turkeys running around Harvard Yard, and I'm talking about the feathered ones. <laughs> Surprising number, and they're aggressive. <laughs> Shane, um, you have spent an awful lot of time helping Montana build the Indian Education for All, mm -hmm. uh, which I haven't been able to check recently, but I know when that whole thing uh, after the court decision kind of triggered it and, and forced a realignment of Montana's education system was unique in the nation um, in that they found in the Constitution a requirement that we make school children aware of all the different cultures and their traditions and their uh, knowledge as part of their basic education. Yep. One of the things that, I'm, I'm gonna, it's gonna seem like a jump here, but um, a lot of people have been observing that we don't have a lot of young people in this room. Mm -hmm. That there is a little bit too much gray hair here. <laughs> and if we are going to make the changes that we seek, we need to get more young people involved in this. And I'm wondering from your experience building on Indian Ed for All. What's worked? What has got 
the kids that you're talking to buzzed and charging out of the room to go do something? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I don't think I can really answer that in a way that's sufficient. Um, you know, I've been out of the classroom, out of the public school classroom since 2002. Um, and Indian Ed for All wasn't really funded until 2005. And so uh, the curriculum that I've designed, um, I haven't had a chance to really implement with kids to see how it all plays out. But one thing I could tell you is uh, working on professional development with teachers has been uh, going to reservations, staying in teepees, um, and breaking down, you know, stereotypes and other things there. And I think that that has empowered teachers to want to um, expand their, their students' understanding and knowledge of their neighbors here in the state. You know, we can be very ge geographically isolated and culturally isolated from one another, Indian reservations to border towns. And, um, you know, I, this last piece I wrote in The Mountain Outlaw uh, about native traditions in Yellowstone, Apsalaga traditions. Um, you know, kids love those stories, and adults do as well. Um, I think, you know, learning the stories is a key. It can save and does salvage a sense of place uh, that we can build on as communities, as classrooms, teachers, and students together to f transform our understanding of what these public lands are, where they come from, why they're important, why, how they're ancient. And I think that you know, only good things can come from that. Um, you know, just reflecting back on your earlier question about you know, who do we pay for these things? You know, this whole stuff that I wrote for uh, Mountain Outlaw the place names, and uh, most of the materials were collected uh, by Timothy McCleary, who's a non-Indian uh, anthropologist at the Little Bighorn College, and his interviews with Native people over years was able to compile them and, you know, identified all of his uh, sources and, you know, gave them all traditional gifts. And then once that knowledge was out there, it's out there. Um, you know, there's no reason why we can't take it and use it to make ourselves better. And uh, I think that's the spirit of generosity. That's the spirit of the land um, that we really need to embrace, that brings us full circle. Um, you know, getting young people to think about these things, talk about these things. It comes back to story, as, as Terry said earlier, and how stories save our lives. They really do. Uh, and, you know, telling the story of our own lives to ourselves is part of that saving. And we cannot do that without bringing the land that we walk on and sleep on and cry on and laugh on and love on. Um, because this is a whole piece of uh, the world that is not going to be there. So I, I want to, you know, I just, to sum up, I guess, sharing experiences with students and teachers on the landscape and informing them with stories, giving them a chance to use their imagination and form community bonds, I think is what, is what the key is. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, you, uh, in, in, in Was It Worth It? Um, pulled a real treasure sack out of your uh, old pile of notes. And a lot of it took place outside of the United States. You were running up rivers in, in uh, Russia. You were chasing jaguars in Mexico. You were tearing around various other parts of the world that have a really different relationship with open space nature, public lands, whatever we want to uh, dance around wilderness, call it. Was there anything in there in particular that you'd like to highlight that might push our United States 
public land wilderness debate forward that you haven't seen us try here? Well, there are notions worth exploring in Russia. They have, instead of having national parks or wilderness areas, they just have, I don't even remember what they call them, but they're areas where they don't have any wardens in there. They don't let anybody in. You know, if, if there's poachers in there, uh, you know, they, they wait till they come out to go after them. And so, you know, it's a place where uh, it's all for the, you know, the natural, natural uh, world that lives there. And uh, it, they just preclude human beings. And I've always, you know, I, personally, I always wanted to sneak onto those places, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it, it was, it's a notion worth exploring. And I, a long time ago, I co-founded a group called Round River Conservation Studies. And uh, we, uh, uh, and I was chairman of the board for 25 years. I'm not with them anymore. But we did a lot of work, and you know, the, the work is with indigenous peoples and uh, uh, throughout the world. We started out a lot in British Columbia, you know, and uh, when we ran across a project in an area, you know, that, that uh, where our views are the same, and basically uh, they're native homelands, and to protect them, we had to uh, nation and nation, uh, uh, you know, the the group helped helped them with all the science and all that all that kind of stuff. But uh, you know, there were there were treaties that were negotiated because in British Columbia, they never settled treaties. You know, there was no exchange, there was no reciprocity up there, and uh, and so they had to reckon with these nations and up and uh, you know up in uh, Helso country up around Bella Bella. You know, there are let's see, was that that's 13 million acres of wilderness that when they, you know, the ink died on the treaty, there was nation to nation, all wolf and grizzly bear trophy hunting stopped overnight. And you know, that's a big chunk of land. And, uh, you know, uh, my, 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 my brother, who took my place as chairman of the board, is uh, John Ward, who's a Taco River Tlingit. and. God, what a man he is. Anyway, in the Taku country, we started out trying to keep a gold mine from, uh, out of there and ended up, this is 30 years in running, um, that is uh, 10 more million acres of wilderness, and that's exactly what the Taku wanted. And it's a place, there's no roads in it, there's nothing in uh, you know, but there'll, there'll be no more mining, there'll be no logging, and uh, we agreed on that. And uh, those guys uh, keep their own score, but you know, Round River, working with indigenous peoples, and this includes the north slope of the Yukon, big areas, you know, millions of acres, uh, you know, 35 to 40 million acres of, of wilderness, or, you know, at least protected homeland, it has the same status as we would call wilderness, and I consider you know that just a, a, a crowning effect. When you look at the world, and you believe, in this case, it was big wilderness. You look 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 at the world, and you see a blank spot on the map. Well, you know, you might as well assume native people live there because they indeed do, and uh, that was the notion behind all that, and it was unusually successful. Terry, uh, you mentioned the, the Kennedy School at Harvard. Um, and for folks who don't know, uh, Harvard College is, is it 10,000 undergrads? Or, and, then, and then there's like 20 or 30,000 uh, masters and, and professionals, and then all kinds of other people, and they're all over in the Kennedy School learning to rule the world. And they spend an awful lot of time learning negotiation. One of the things that a lot of folks are talking about here today is the, uh, the Blackfoot Clearwater Stewardship Act, and I've been trying to cover that as a journalist. And the biggest obstacle that I'm seeing in that is not between Republicans and Democrats, it is between wilderness supporters 
who are willing to either be <laughs> transactional and say, I will give up something in return for something else, and others who are saying, no, I will stick for purity or nothing. And I don't mean this to be overly melodramatic, but that seemed to boil down to me as, how do you deal with the devil? How do you make a agreement with somebody who you cannot morally or by your value principles find any common ground, and yet you still must make a deal because the time's running out? We see it in the Kennedy School all the time, and I hate the process, and I never found a, a good, uh, comfortable place there. And I don't know from your side uh, in the Divinity School if you had any better success. It's so funny. If you go to the Divinity School, everyone whispers. You know, it's really quiet, <laughs> and everyone's sort of wounded, you know, and searching for something. You go to the Ten <laughs> Kennedy School, it's, uh, oh, and everyone's an introvert says, excuse me, you know. Um, you go to the Kennedy School and it's all extroverts and they have all the answers and they're trying to convince you of something. So it's a very different mindset. The, the story I will tell quickly is, I was thinking about that very thing and I happen, I hope I'm not, I guess once a Mormon you're always Mormon, but I happen to like the devil. I think the, it's a very provocative archetype. Um, and devil spelled backwards is lived, so. <laughs> I don't view that as negative, but Jason Chavitz was a person that, let me just say, it made me less calm in the world. And he was at the Kennedy School the same time I was. So I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to have a conversation together, you know, as a co-sponsor, Divinity School, um, Kennedy School? And he wouldn't do it. And so I finally said, how about just lunch? And he said, you know, I'm really busy, but I could meet you at the vending machine. <laughs> That's where the devil lives. <laughs> and so I thought, I said, sure, what vending, what vending machine would you like? <laughs> and we met in the basement of the Kennedy School at this very dark vending machine. And we had a great conversation. It turns out he loves Thoreau. Um, as it always happens in Utah, he's best friends with my cousin's husband who was a kicker for the Bengals, you know, and we talked about football, which I really knew very little about. Um, but, you know, I think once you have a conversation with someone, whether it's at a vending machine or, you know, on the, in the post office, they, you can't hate them. You can be amused by them, they can, you know, um, frustrate you, but somehow you see each other for where you are and you find that point and you move on. Doug and I were just talking this morning and Andrea about, you know, you can't, it's hard to keep hate going. Um, it takes a lot of energy. Um, my nieces and I did an experiment and I'll end here. We went out in the backyard and saw how much energy it took to say yay, and how much it took to say boo. It was a long story of why we got to that point. But <laughs> the energy it took to boo, really a passionate boo, took a lot more energy. And so I, again, I'm just, maybe I'm old enough where, you know, life's beaten all of us down. We're all humbled, you know, no one gets out of this, in my mind, arrogant if you're alive. And why not just find out where our broken pieces are? Rick, um, one of the things that got me thinking about the, the timeliness of books the, in the shameless self-promotion department, I just wrote a book about grizzly bears. And press send and the presses ran and the books showed up in a box and then the three governors of Idaho, well, Montana and Wyoming all declared that predators were now fair game and they would like them removed from the endangered species list and a grizzly bear took a woman out of her tent in the middle of a bike 
uh, campground and killed her. And uh, 399, we're all familiar with 399, the grizzly bear of the Grand Tetons, the grizzly mama par excellence, according to the Washington Post, will probably die this year and will probably lose one or all of her current yearling cubs because she has become so habituated to human food, uh, the odds of her making it to next hibernation are, I think, really poor. You're on the edge of the cabinet yak ecosystem where you have got maybe 50 grizzly bears clinging to a environment that may or may not be a recovery area. Is making a grizzly into a character like 399 effective, or is it actually going to hurt your ghost bears that are floating around, maybe somewhere invisible in the act? A lot, lot, of, lot of questions in there. Um, and Fire at will. We come back to the story. If I can rephrase the, the description of, of that, that landscape, what's called the Cabinet Yak, you know, way up north and west on the Canadian border. And the Idaho border, it's a political uh, name, and the names we give things, you know, really, really matter. And, and uh, the grizzlies in the Yak Valley, there's no genetic connection to the grizzlies in the Cabinet Mountains. The grizzlies in the Yak Valley, 20 to 25, according to Fish and Wildlife Service, three adult females with cubs. They cannot or choose not to reach the Cabinet Mountains. Cabinets are all 100% artificial, artificially augmented population. They're brought there in trucks. They went extinct in the Cabinet Mountains. It's pretty steep habitat, and it's hard to have big wild areas like Doug says they, they need. You know that. Uh, the Yak, on the other hand, is, is all 100%. You know original clade four or whatever, whatever it was that came, came down. That's such a huge difference between the two. So I always, I, I, I resist calling the cabinet yak 50 animals. I, I mean, it's, it, it, that's, that's not the truth. I mean, it's like calling, the two are separated and that we just have to tell the truth on that and, and not let the government call it resilience or restoration or cabinet yak ecosystem. It, it, it's two entirely different Genetic isolate, genetically isolated places. The thing about, back to story, you know, does, does following the, uh, the, the habits of, of a bear, such as 399 or, or the black grizzly uh, or uh, uh, DJ, uh, in, in the case of the yak, who was the penultimate mother, raised, you know, a dozen different, uh, generations or litters of cubs and uh, and they were her females were the best mothers and and uh, I think stories about animals is uh, uh, many days I think that's stories about anything other than ourselves is all that can get us out of this jackpot so you know more power to stories about about animals on the landscape um, yeah Yellowstone's you know got Several bears, the act doesn't have any. Yeah, I could see, I could see conflict if we celebrated a bear, but uh, there are a lot of mosquitoes up there and, and no services, no cell coverage, and, and folks are really unpleasant. I just don't, I think, I, think, I, th I just don't see us being a, a recreational paradise. Uh, <laughs> For, for everybody, can you take notes? Because we all can't hear each other, <laughs> which is sometimes the real problem in negotiation. <laughs> Shane, um, Terry at, at her talk gave us a remarkable perspective of what she heard yesterday in just sort of compiling the, the things that really struck her out of the conversations. I would love to know what you heard yesterday and what you would love this audience to highlight and take home and spread out. Does someone else want to take that? 
Uh, uh, actually, I'm going to throw that to the whole, whole line here. It's tough for me to articulate, honestly. Uh, What's one thing that you're going to go home and tell everybody in the house, this is what happened, this is why this weekend was worth it? Well, I got to meet Kevin Redstar and, you know, uh, <laughs> and Terry Tempest Williams. Um, you know, I... I'm fans of all the people that came here and, and, and you know, are sharing their wise words. Uh, I think that what we all need to do is um, get out and vote, for one thing. Uh, yeah. And I'm going to do my part to make sure I can help out with all that. You know, there's a, there's, a, uh, there's a desperate, there's a sense of desperation is what I guess I'm taking from all this. If I could just pinpoint one thing, you know, we, all of us here and the authors here, um, understand that we have a lot to lose right now at this moment in time. And um, we're not gonna do it, we're not gonna win those things by fighting and ripping the guts and heart out of our opponents. Um, we're only going to do that through, you know, leadership that emphasizes collaboration, trust, um, compassion, discipline, uh, a respect for science and knowledge, uh, community, um, and I think all those things that we can, we can help promote within our families, um, within our friendships. You know, we start with small circles and we, you know, build them, build on them. And I feel like this is a circle here. All of us that have experienced this the past few days have come in a circle. And there's a lot of love and respect here. And it's inspiring. Even in these desperate times, we have each other. And because of that, we're buoyed to, to continue the work, uh, to continue telling the stories. You know, I've got stuff I'm writing right now. You know, this past piece that I wrote for Mountain Outlaw, millions of people will read that. There's really nothing else in the, uh, uh, about Native people in the park, honestly. I, I challenge any of you to find it. You know, there's the book that Larry Lowendorf and Nabokov wrote, um, but it's all, I mean, it, I mean, there's that, but I'm talking about something that people can put in their hands and, and pick up and read. I got paid $500 for that. Basically nothing. And that does not bother me in the slightest bit. You know, I'm happy because people are going to learn. Kids are going to know. And they're going to grow up with those stories. They're not going to learn it when they're, you know, 70 years old or 50 or 60 or even 40 or 30. It's like when they're 8 years old, they're going to learn about how the native people in the park um, fasted there, prayed there, made, used the, the sacred waters to build a precious, you know, bows. Um, so not to go on and on, which I am, but uh, we need each other. We need each other more than ever. And that's, I guess, the biggest point that I'm taking from all this. And, and we're coming through for one another. That's why we showed up. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why we showed up. Thank you all. Thank you all, you guys and ladies. Uh -huh. Thank you, Rob, and everyone. Uh, we are, as soon as we get our uh, area up here rearranged, which will take about two minutes. Uh, we're going to move on to John McLean. So give me a moment. We'll get the podium up here. Okay, everybody. Uh, we are ready to go. Uh, <clears throat> books, rivers, and too damn many people. 
uh, is the title to uh, what we're about to hear from John McLean. Uh, John loves fly fishing the Big Blackfoot River, made famous by his father's iconic book and its inherent part of this talk. Uh, John Norman McLean, he's a journalist, an author, uh, written five books on fatal wildland fires and, and most recently a memoir, Home Waters, A Chronicle of Family in a River. He's the son, could I have a little quiet out there please? Back, the chatter and the, the conversations back there carry forward. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> he's the son of Norman McLean, uh, as we already know, author of A River Runs Through It and Young Men in Fire. Uh, John will be taking questions at the end of his uh, talk, so if we could uh, make our staff aware that we'll want to run around with a microphone at that point after that, it'd be great. With that, I will turn it over to John. Hi, Kajari. I assume that was for Jerry. <laughs> well, it's always nice to be back uh, to play the Wilma again. <laughs> They've done a beautiful job of restoring this place. Uh, my dad used to come here uh, when he could sneak away and get into vaudeville. Uh, Paul did the same thing. Uh, this was their home theater. Uh, the photograph that's behind me is of my home waters and his and a lot of people's. Uh, that picture is of my son fishing it one evening uh, some years ago now. Uh, last year, really for the first time, I was driven away from there twice by the crowds. Uh, I went down there to do a little work in the afternoon and I thought I would take a rod and catch the evening rise. Uh, it's right above a put-in. And one boat after another kept coming in, and one great big rig after another kept hauling them out. And uh, I said, to hell with it, and left. And that happened twice. That's one of the all-time favorite uh, fishing places for me and for everybody in my family. All is not lost. Uh, old Montana it wasn't as perfect as we think it was. We didn't have electricity, which has made an enormous difference. Montana was, as Ross Toole tells us in his historical studies, a place of extractive economic activity and absentee owners. You'd get rich with the Merck, the Missoula Merck, living somewhere else, take your money and go start the San Francisco Opera. People will say that a river runs through it ruined Montana. And there's some truth to that if you add the movie and perhaps even now my book. We brought a lot of people to this state. But we did a lot of other things too. We brought in hundreds of millions of dollars in recreational spending. Blackfoot River was restored from being an open sewer uh, poisoned by cadmium as a consequence of the Mycorse Dam uh, collapse to what it is today, which is the last time I was able to fish it anyway, uh, a better fishery than when I was a kid, to be perfectly honest. There is a lot of gray hair in here, but uh, for those of us, those of you who are lucky enough to have some left, uh, unlike me, uh, but what I'm hoping is that Home Waters does something very different, and that Home Waters becomes a vehicle for conservation, using a broad term for that. Uh, the Library of Congress uh, program that uh, you can learn about, if you haven't already, uh, in the back, is altogether directed toward young people. Teaching young people a sense of place, and their own place, of the importance of it, the depth of it, and it's working. Uh, these kids have come up with a lot of stuff that I didn't know about. There's one exhibit there about Helena, uh, the McLeans in Helena, that has got uh, addresses and information. Uh, 
that I didn't have, and I've spent some time looking into that kind of thing. And if we can connect kids with their own land and give them a sense of how important it is and how their effect on it matters, then we've done our job. And they can make of it what they will, for good or for bad. Whoa. What made possible our life in Montana was our cabin at Seely Lake. I had a very interesting interview the other day with a gal from, uh, who works sometimes for the Flathead Beacon, and she said, what does it mean to have a cabin in the woods? And it's a simple kind of sounding question, and those are often the very best questions, and I've been thinking about it ever since. And if we hadn't had a cabin in the woods, we would have lost our connection to Montana, and an awful lot of things would never have happened. Among them, uh, River Runs Through It, and uh, all the other books that have followed from it. The cabin, this is the centennial uh, anniversary of the building of the cabin. We signed the lease with the Forest Service uh, in 1921. My grandfather did in August of that year, and by the next year, he was working on the cabin. Built it all by hand with his wife, Clara, and his two sons, Norman and Paul. Uh, the wood that was used for it was cut from right around uh, the lot. In fact, it was cut so aggressively by so many people that the Forest Service sent out a notice and said, stop it. Uh, we've got another place over here on the uh, other side of the lake uh, where we have marked out a lodgepole forest. Please cut that and stop doing it right around your cabins. They lived a very simple life there. Uh, Presbyterian minister doesn't have a lot of money. Uh, and while they used bamboo rods, which we think of today as expensive articles, they were not in those days. They were the, about the only thing you had. That one on the, on the right, your right, is a Monty. Uh, I rescued it from the cabin uh, many years ago and didn't know what it was. It's, there are no marks on it. It's just a three-piece uh, bamboo rod. And finally, a guy identified it for me uh, this past year, and it's uh, basically the kind of rod you would get if you went into a hardware store, which is what they did. Uh, it's a Montague, and known as a Mountie. But the cabin made a whole alternative lifestyle possible for my father, uh, for me, uh, and for our family. We lived also at the University of Chicago neighborhood, Hyde Park, uh, which is a congested urban neighborhood uh, built around a university, a great university, um, kind of hyper-intellectual, very different from here. And if he hadn't been able to go back in the summer and spend a long time at Seely Lake, and not just a couple of weeks with relatives, uh, things would have transpired very differently. And as of now, we're up to five generations and counting. Uh, one of my jobs is to try to get that cabin in good enough shape to pass on to the next generation so it doesn't drag them down. Uh, my dad had a real hard time with the cabin. Uh, it's an expensive operation to run that thing. Uh, it's difficult to do the work on it when you're there just briefly. Luckily, we had the Burns family uh, to help out with that, and they cared for it then, just as one of my cousins, a Burns cousin, and her husband are doing an awful lot of work on the cabin now. But a lot of this is pretty fundamental. We've got an old ice house that was going into the ground like a ship sinking into a sea, you just do, And it was either tear it down or do something radical about it. And what we've discovered is that it's the last ice house in the whole region, because everybody else got sick and tired of them and tore theirs down. You know, they're kind of whipped up at the end, you fill them with sawdust, 
we had a guy from Seely Lake who would go out and saw great big chunks of ice out of Seely Lake in the winter, bury them in the sawdust, and you would still get little wet spots by the end of, uh, of August. I went and got electricity, you didn't need that, so we changed it into a warehouse, and it's been struggling. I think we can get uh, some grants to help with that. Uh, but it's a very slow process <laughs> out here when I'm not here very often. I'm here for a month early and a month late. And I'm trying to get the kids involved in this. And I think we'll get it done. Uh, we've got the Historical Society involved in it. But there are other big projects like that. So keeping up an alternate lifestyle is not a modest undertaking. It's a major undertaking. But it can have major consequences. Certainly has for us. I've been working on uh, an Ernest Hemingway story, Big Two-Hearted River, which is coming up for its centennial of publication in 2025. And it's going to be getting a lot of attention. And a couple essays about it. It's fun. Ernest Hemingway's family had a cabin in the woods at Lake Walloon. Their home was in Oak Park, not far from where we were, in Hyde Park, on the lakefront. Oak Park is a western, near western suburb of Chicago. And he thought about Oak Park roughly the way I thought about Hyde Park. He wanted to get away from it, <laughs> and he did. And he wouldn't have written Big Two-Hearted River, which is one of the great fishing stories of all time. And more than that, it's also a big mystery story. He wouldn't have written that if he hadn't had a cabin in the woods like that. I said at the beginning, you know, some things uh, about old Montana weren't so great, and some things about new Montana aren't so great, but there's still a lot of good in between. This morning I spent a half hour in the cabin just about where you can see, watching a deer, just about like this one, having breakfast. And I was trying to figure out what the deer was eating and not eating. And I'm sure there are people here who could have answered that without doing it. But that was all that was going on. <laughs> the boats hadn't started out yet. The jet skis weren't fired up yet. It was a beautiful morning, and it could have been 1922. So there's a lot left. We haven't wrecked it all. Yet. I don't think my father would have done well had he stayed in Montana, or as well. When he got out of Dartmouth, he came back and he applied for a teaching job and wanted to teach high school. And he didn't have the education credits and by that time, he had taught as a teaching assistant, the last of the indentured servants, for two years at Dartmouth. And the state of Montana told him he didn't have qualifications to be a teacher in high school in Montana. And he was enraged by that. And he turned away and never applied for a job out here again found his way back to the University of Chicago with a curse, almost. Uh, he, he was not happy with a lot of things about the way Montana was run, politically, legislatively, and certainly not the way they ran their um, Board of Education. But frankly, every state does that. I mean, there are qualifications to teach high school. <laughs> if you don't want to do it, don't take the courses and find something else to do in life. But that's the way he was. That's what it looks like in front of our cabin. This was taken uh, in the fall when the color is very beautiful. And it's right in front of what was the old Koch cabin. Ehlers Koch was a legendary forest ranger uh, here in Missoula, one of the main guys who fought the great fires of 1910. And he had a cabin next to ours. Uh, the Forest Service, his home agency, uh, exercised right of eminent domain and destroyed the cabin uh, in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And almost every time I come out here, I take a photograph from the site of the cabin 
and send it to Ehlers Koch's grandson, Peter, whom I grew up with as a friend of mine, and it makes him cry. That was kind of a rough thing to do. And the reason they did it is because even that long ago, before a river runs through it came out and ruined Montana, the campground, which is to the right in this photograph, the Sealy Lake campground, was overrun with potheads. And the Forest Service had decided that they would not arrest people. I've got the letter where they said, we can't, this is society has decided that this is okay. And we can't go in there with law enforcement and stop it. And they would come down and steal my father's wood. And there'd be this cloud of marijuana smoke, he swore, uh, coming from the campground. And so they made a buffer zone between the campground and our cabin. And it worked which is lucky because we were the next cabin that would have been taken. And we thought for a while that we were going to lose the cabin. It's always been kind of a chancy proposition. Uh, th those of you who are familiar with the Cabin Fee Act know that uh, lease fees on these cabins went skyrocketing. Ours was nearly $17,000 a year at one point. For, uh, and finally, Senator Tester and Senator Danes uh, contributed to an effort to come up with legislation that made it possible to hold on to these cabins on Forest Service leases. That's my dad. And not all of that slide got in there, so I'll finish it. This is from the Bitterroot uh, uh, yearbook. They joked so of his talking, I won't even mention it, for it's most with other talents that he always makes a hit. Well, sometimes, you know, your high school buddies have got you figured out. <laughs> My dad wanted to be like his father, and that's why they called him preacher, because he would get up and declaim. And that's what he wound up doing in class. He would get up and be his father and declaim. And it was very satisfying to him. He got out of Montana and went to Dartmouth, uh, an uncle worked on the East Coast uh, for universities as a vendor of one kind or another, knew a lot of people, and could have gotten him in basically wherever he wanted to go. He had very fine grades. He was almost straight A at uh, Missoula County High School. And he went to Harvard and listened to the classes and decided that was really not for him, and he would prefer the Indian school which Dartmouth claimed to be at the time, and wasn't for a long time, but has since become. They now have a big Native American uh, scholarship program that really works. Uh, they do a lot. Uh, uh, they have regained the legacy. So he went to Dartmouth uh, and had this schizophrenic relationship with it. He was very successful. He was the editor of the Jack-O-Lantern magazine which meant that he was paid. And I went back and found out how much he was paid, and it was a lot more than the tuition, annual tuition. He was paying his own way. At the same time, he resented the East Coast, had a real sore back about that. Always did. And when I moved to the East Coast, Washington, D.C., he would come out. And when I was at Harvard, I, I went to Harvard for a year, uh, he came there, and we went looking for the place where he'd stayed on vacations with his uncle and couldn't find it, but it was, he was very uncomfortable in that setting. He was not uncomfortable at the University of Chicago, which was then and is now a tough school. They're the ones who came up with the manifesto that said, when you come here, we are going to challenge your ideas. We're not going to be soft on you. We're going to kick you around, and you better learn to kick back. And some enlightened schools have signed up for that. Many more have folded. Oh, microaggression. Oh, we can't do this to our little students. What the hell kind of people are you going to turn out if that's the way you treat them? Little softy, squiggly worms. And my old man liked being tough 
on students. I used to hear them on the phone when they would call to get an extension <laughs> on their paper. What the hell are you doing calling me at home? Get that paper in on time. You know the deadline. Click. Picture on the left, I think, was taken after Paul's murder. Um, the year would have had to have been late in the 1930s because I knew both those dogs. Uh, that was our Irish setter on the left, Mugen, and the Reverend's uh, uh, dog, uh, Water Spaniel, on the right. That would have been in Missoula. He's wearing a tie. He was teaching by then. The one on your right <laughs> is a very interesting story. Uh, George Krunenbergs was our great family friend and uh, my mentor as a fisherman, and I adored him. Uh, he was the youngest of the Krunenberg boys and just a great person and, uh, to go fishing with. And he was an enormous guy, great big guy. And my father was not very big. He was 5'8 and a half, 165 pounds. And if you want to know how that works out when you're fishing on a small mountain lake, take a look at their legs. One of them had to wade way out in order to get room to cast. The other did not. Well, that's our river. Oh, God, it's beautiful. And it still is. That photograph on the left uh, was the basis for a wood engraving in Home Waters. Uh, we worked with a very fine artist named Wesley Bates. When I was doing Home Waters, uh, I knew that it was going to be a caboose, uh, in a way, to a river runs through it. And at first, I really didn't want to do it for that reason. But I'd already been through all that with Young Men and Fire, my dad's book, and Fire on the Mountain, my book, which are twin, more or less twinned. And uh, I'd taken the kind of guff you take for doing that. And here we are 25 years later, and Fire on the Mountain is still regarded as a standard work within the fire world. It is used in training. It is respected. Uh, and I've written five books about wildland fire, uh, which also fall into that category. So I, you know, I've been through this. I've done it. Why not do this too? Uh, and one thing I did that was a conscious imitation of a river runs through it was the wood engravings. Uh, the bookstore that's selling books back here has that the blue book, the little blue book, the first edition of a river runs through it. And if you look at it, and better yet, if you buy it, uh, there are wood engravings at the beginning of the chapters. And there's one on the cover of a great big cliff with a river going past it and some landscape in the background. And people have tried to figure out, what is that? Where is that on the Blackfoot? Jerry O'Connell couldn't find it. <laughs> and he can find anything on the Blackfoot that's connected with the river runs through it. Uh, well, where is it in Montana or is it in Wyoming? Nobody knew. Before I ever got into home waters, a guy called me up and says, I'm doing an essay on the illustrations of a river runs through it, all of them, all the editions. I've been trying to get a hold of the guy who did those wood engravings for the first edition, and the University of Chicago Press, which publishes it, is not being any help. Can you help me? I said, well, let me see what I can do. So we found the guy. He's in his 80s. He's living in retirement in Hyde Park. And the first question is, what about the cover? And he said, oh, I made that up. <laughs> Mystery solved. I and mean, that's fine. My dad had said that he had brought the illustrations back and that they were basically traced. He didn't say that, but that was the impression for the woodcuts, uh, wood engravings in there. And I asked uh, Williams about that, and he said, no, no. He said he brought back a lot of illustrations, but every one of those is something that I did. It's, they're original. So I said, well, I want to, to my editor, I said, I want to do that for Home Waters. I want to do it differently. I want to have the uh, wood engravings tied to the text. 
And this was the first one. And I said, well, on this one, I want three figures in it. And if you look at the first illustrate of wood engraving in Home Waters, there are three figures. And in the foreground is a tall figure and a little boy figure. And in the middle ground is a medium-sized figure. No, it doesn't mean anything to anybody but me. What it means to me is that's George Kronenberg's and me. And my dad fishing downstream. And that's the way we fished a lot. My dad turned me over to George, teach him while I go fish this hole down here. And it worked. Then the last wood engraving in home waters is a similar scene. It's a sweeping bend of the river, and there is one medium-sized figure in it. That's very purposeful. As you go through home waters, you go through 200 years from 1806 when Meriwether Lewis and a small party went through the Blackfoot Valley, all the way through when the McLeans first came into Montana, all the way through to the present day and into the future. So when you get to the final illustration, it's just me. The other two have dropped out. I didn't think that was narcissistic. I thought it was kind of neat to do it that way. It may also have been narcissistic. That's the same hole uh, that I showed in the first uh, image. And I have it here because of that rock. Uh, everybody in my family who fishes <laughs> has sat on that rock and watched for an evening rise. My grandfather sat there, Paul sat there, Norman, me, my sons, and I hope their children. The fish on the right is a cutthroat uh, on a beautiful stretch of river that has been changed by natural forces. Uh, it's on the Landers Fork, which is a tributary of the, of the Blackfoot, and it was affected by fire, by the Alice Creek fire. Uh, I haven't got the year, 10, 12 years ago, anyway. And it stripped all the streamside vegetation down to uh, smoldering ash. And the temperature of the water went up. And if that fish were there today, he'd be making tracks for upstream where it's still cool. The fish don't hold in the lander's fork anymore. That just happens. That's life. These things change on their own is the point. That's the upper Blackfoot on the left near Lincoln in the Blackfoot Canyon. When uh, Lewis and his party went through there, they did not go down in that bottom land, which is all uh, willowy and marshy. They went up on the side hill. And when I was doing the story and trying to re reconstruct the road to the, uh, road to the buffalo, uh, Ron Cox, the historian for the Seedley Lake uh, Historical Society, and I went in there and found uh, a remnant portion of that, uh, of that old road to the buffalo. The one on the right is a uh, Blackfoot rainbow, and a nice one. Not a great one, but a nice one. So I said, you know, river runs through it, ruined Montana. And one thing it did was bring in people by the tens of thousands. Uh, some of them know how to behave, and some do not. And what is the difference? If you come here to check off something on your life list, now I know what Norman McLean did. I've done that, and now I can go off to Tuscany and do something fabulous else. Don't come, please. What's happened is that old Montana is deeply threatened. Uh, it's very hard to live here now if you're a Montanan. Here being Missoula or Bozeman, university towns where the real estate prices have gone through the roof. I've had two friends tell me in the last couple of weeks that they have left Missoula or are leaving Missoula because they couldn't afford a house. 
and they both work. One of them, a nice girl, uh, who is a fanatic about two-man saws, about you know, the old misery whips, and she took a couple from my cabin and is fixing them up. She got herself a nice husband, they both work, couldn't buy a house, and she went back to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. The other is a friend of mine who works for uh, a conservation agency, has a very good job, and he can't afford to live here, and he's moving to Butte. So if that's your attitude, I'm gonna come out there, and I work IT, and I have a big salary, and I can work from home, and not really be part of the community, uh, and go out and beat the fish to death in the afternoon, and cash my check, that also is not the way to do this. The way to do this is to give back. Find some way, your way, not my way, your way, to give back to Montana. Because you're taking a lot. You're taking away from us what we had for generations. It wasn't perfect, it wasn't that. But it was ours. And it's gone in a lot of places. Not everywhere, but a lot of places. And what we have done is to give back in the form of books. A lot of them. Everybody knows the books at the top. Uh, River Run Shoot, Young Men on Fire, and now, I hope you know about Home Waters. Uh, the ones in the middle are my fire books, which are still used uh, for training purposes and still have a general readership. Earlier this week, I was meeting with people from the fire lab here in Missoula. And we are going to be working together in the fall on a analysis presentation that I do about the similarities in decision making between the South Canyon Fire of 1994 and the Yarnell Hill Fire of 2013. Both of those were multiple fatality fires. And I worked for eight years on the Yarnell Hill Fire on a book on that with a partner. The partnership broke down uh, at the beginning of this year. I don't regret it because we just didn't agree on a lot of stuff. Um, but I, I can do this without violating terms of the partnership. And it turns out that uh, the Forest Service has come to some of the same conclusions I have about how to conduct a fire investigation. They called me up, they said, you know, we're doing this, we're changing the whole thing. Uh, can we talk to you about how to conduct a fire investigation? You know, I go, oh yes, me, 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 I can do all this, I'm so great. And I talked to the guy, and he was very respectful on the phone, and I went through my shtick, and he just listened very quietly, and I made two points. One is, you've got to start going back to people after you have interviewed them and show them what you have got. If it's a transcript, or if it's a summary of a transcript, or if it's the beginning of your account, of their account, whatever, you gotta go back to them and say, does this match what you told us? Does this work for you? And the second thing you've gotta do is come up with plan B. Because in decision making on fatal fires, I found again and again, and on the two that I mentioned, South Canyon and Yarnell Hill, that a supervisor comes up with a plan to fight the fire. And the only alternative that the crew has is either to rebel, and these are militaristic organizations, you don't do that lightly, you don't just say no lightly, is either to rebel or to go along with the supervisor. They've got to have something I don't know what it is, I don't know how to write it, but something where they can say, well, we listen to your plan and we think it sucks, and sorry, we didn't mean that. We, we listen to your plan and we respect it, and here's our alternative, which has just as much moral weight as yours does, because it's in the ye little yellow book, the handbook on how to fight a fire. And our plan involves fighting the fire, but just maybe waiting a while before we do that. If you tell a firefighter, I have a plan to fight the fire, what have you got? And he says, I don't have a plan to fight the fire. You're gonna do what you said. That's what they do. They fight fire. They are aggressive, tough people, girls and boys. So I got through with this speech. He said, oh yeah, we're doing both those things. <laughs> <laughs> How wonderful. So we, 
he and the people from the fire lab came out to the cabin, and it's a process that's, that's ongoing. They're just getting started on it, and it's so, it's so good that it's almost scary. I mean, they're really doing things that are going to save people's lives. None of us are so naive to think that you're going to eliminate fire deaths in wildfire. Fire is really dangerous stuff. These people are aggressive. Fighting it is a dangerous job. People will die. But you can cut the number, and you can extend the time between these great catastrophic events when a dozen or more people are killed. And it's already happened, some. It can happen more. So I'm working with them on that. That's a give back. That's a give back to Montana and the West. I mean, I live in Washington, D.C. I don't winter over here. But I don't check this place off on a life list. This is my life. And it certainly is true of my dad. I mean, his two books are about Montana. Lots of people now use it. I it was uh, coming down today, and the boat, boats are already out. That's fine. And some of them are just white watering. But uh, when you go to the Harry Morgan put in on the North Fork of the Blackfoot, and there are 50 to 100 rigs there, you know you're getting into serious overuse. And it isn't just degrading the resource, it is destroying the experience. Uh, earlier, the Blackfoot Clearwater Stewardship Act was mentioned. Is Steve Daines here? Is Senator Daines here? You never know. And it was suggested that the problem is that it's tough to make legislation. It's tough to make compromises, and that's certainly true. The problem with the Blackfoot Clearwater Stewardship Act is Steve Daines. He has played, yes. He has played dog in the manger on this for years. And he's doing it now. Those of us who support this semi-professionally or professionally are prepared to make him a hero. Late conversions are accepted. <laughs> but there was supposed to be a markup this month for the first time in the relevant Senate committee, and he asked for a delay for a month and didn't explain himself. I listened to discussion about the bill in November in that committee, because you can get these things online now, the whole thing, all of it, and he introduced the bill and talked about it, da 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 and when he got done with it, one of his fellow senators said very respectfully, he said, Senator Daines, I can't figure out, are you for this bill or are you against it? The latest polling by the University of Montana, which has polled this thing for a long time, every two years, and all the scores in the mid-70s, positive. 85% of Montanans, for God's sake, support the Blackfoot Clearwater Stewardship Act. You can't get 85% of Montanans to agree on North. <laughs> the one time he came up with something specific long ago. It was to take the 300,000 acres that are in wilderness study and take it out of wilderness study. And that was pulled and flunked. So when he talks about it, he says, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to trade off. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to study this and see what I can, you know. It's a handful of mush. I think if you still get it on YouTube, I suggest you listen to it if you can stand listening to a handful of mush. I mean, there's nothing there. So he's not being a politician. Politicians make sausage, and it ain't pretty, but they do it. That's what they're elected to do. And he's not being a Montana, because he is denying a sustained overmajority of you people in Montana who want this. If you have a billion dollar a year recreational industry, which you have here, you ought to do something to try to help it. And I don't mean paving 17 miles of the Johns Rudd dirt road to make it easier for big rigs to get in there. And so people can have a more comfortable ride 
as they go in to hammer the river. Or saying, well, 50 to 100 rigs that the Har uh, Harry Morgan put in, we better build a bigger parking lot, which is what they said. Or, well, we better have some more primitive campsites on the Blackfoot. Let's find more ways to wreck it. What you need, folks, is a permit system. I'm basically an optimist. <laughs> you wouldn't know it, but I am. Uh, one of the reasons I'm optimistic is this Library of Congress program, which is <laughs> honcho by Cheryl Hughes and Deb Mitchell, and I'm kind of the, they're the big driving engine, I'm kind of the flag man. I stand there with the green flag. Yeah, great, go. And we have 10 projects this year that mostly involve kids learning about a sense of place. They've done wonderful stuff. You can see it in the back here. Uh, the, some kids did uh, the McLeans in Helena. They came up with things I didn't know anything about, where Paul lived, uh, the church that my uh, grandfather uh, preached in when he lived in Helena, all kinds of stuff. Uh, solid sense of place. So the next generation is being trained. It is possible to do this. There's one of their projects, uh, Garrison School. The kids just get a sense of, of their own place. And that uh, Road to the Buffalo is uh, igniting interest. One of the nice things about a book is that there's a follow-on. Things are ignited that happen that didn't make it into the book because they hadn't happened yet. They happened because of the book. And people have started to come up with stuff about the Road to the Buffalo finding segments of it that we hadn't identified for sure before, incorporating it at uh, Traveler's Rest State Park as some, this is something we should do more with. That trip by Meriwether Lewis and his uh, small band is ignored by historians for, for good reason. Uh, the expedition, the Corps of uh, Discovery split at Traveler's Rest in the Bitterroot, and Lewis uh, took a northern route, Clark a southern route. And Lewis and his small party went through the Blackfoot Valley, over the Continental Divide, out on the plain, uh, and eventually ran into the Blackfeet and killed two of them. That is the incident that the historians uh, focus on and should. There's nothing about this trip. The road to the Buffalo was a cultural lifeline for 5,000 years. It went along the Blackfoot River. It went along the Clark Fork as well. It united the Native American tribes on the west side of the Continental Divide with the buffalo to the east. And they would often do it twice a year to get enough buffalo. Can you imagine doing that one in the winter on horseback? The minute Meriwether Lewis set foot on that trail marks the beginning of the end of the buffalo culture. Now, there are other places where you could say that when they left St. Louis, it was the end. Now, this is very specific. This is the road that was used to get out to the buffalo. And as soon as the white man hit it, it was going to be over. Because the traders followed, the fur traders and trappers followed almost immediately. They got into battle after battle with the Indians. And you all know the story from there. And it wound up that a few ranches, and they vie and compete with each other as to who can uh, be the only one who did it, collected a few buffalo calves and put them in a corral, and they're the ones who saved the buffalo from extinction. The buffalo were nearly extinct within 100 years. And that trip is indicative of the beginning of the end. I put it in there at length in the book, and I knew I was going to get in trouble doing that. Some people would say, well, if you're like Lewis and Clark, yeah, but mm, boy, it goes on and on. It does, and I'd do it the same way again. And kids are picking up on this and getting it. The Missoula County High School class, English class, went to the Mike Horse Dam at, in Rogers Pass, the headwaters of the Blackfoot, with Tim Ryan, who is a Native American and a cultural uh, professor in the Flathead Valley. And he told them about the 5,000-year history. 
and they had an engineer there who told them about how the Mycor Dam broke and let all that cadmium flow through the Blackfoot. And they had people there who talked about other parts of it. So you got a sense of the whole history of the Blackfoot River as not just a fishery, but as an aid to an interstate highway that was a cultural lifeline <coughs> for people for a long time. Whoa, I'm hitting the wrong button. I had it upside down, I apologize. Paul McLean uh, started it all. Uh, if it hadn't been for his murder, uh, I don't think my dad would have written A River Runs Through It, certainly not in the spiritual depth that he did. He was never free of a sense of having failed to stop that murder right to the end. They were very close, unusually close. Um, my dad and his father both tried to help Paul, and they probably tried too hard, probably tried to do too much for him. But Paul had his own problems. And he, he's been a shadow person for me my entire life. And I have learned as much from his mistakes, I think, if not more, than I learned from his positive qualities, which were considerable. Like him, I'm a newspaper reporter. Like him, I'm a fisherman. But uh, if you lived the way he did, you were going to come to a bad end. And so there are things that he did that I have either stopped or avoided, and for which I am thankful. He was a hell of a fisherman. That's one hell of a fish on the left. And I can't tell whether it's Missoula would be a Clark Fork fish. Uh, it's awfully big for a Blackfoot fish until recently when they got rid of the dam uh, at Milltown and fish from the Clark Fork were once again able to move up into their traditional spawning grounds in the Blackfoot River. And the story of the big rainbow in home waters I believe is about one of those fish because it was roughly the same size uh, as the one on the left there. There's the Bitterroot, uh, your book. He was the best blocker on the team, never failing to get his man on every play. That was Paul, right to the end. And if you read River Home Waters, you will see a reliable factual account of his murder in Chicago. I thought it was important to do that because of all the nonsense about him never leaving Montana and uh, being uh, killed in Montana and how it was all because of his gambling debts and so on. It was a fairly meaningless, back alley, brutal encounter that he probably did a good deal uh, to provoke. You see on the left he was, uh, capable of a hard eye. Uh, that photograph on the right is my father. And my dad used to say, no wonder we left Montana. When my brother was killed, his own newspaper couldn't even get it the right picture in. <laughs> that is one of the uh, Wesley Bates woodcuts.
Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Q and A uh, questions, and we have a we have a mic pro. We have a mic person. Uh, I have a question over here. If I could be so bold as to make two comments. One is a challenge, and one is a story to tell a bit of the, um, of the effect, worldwide effect, of your father's book and the movie that followed it. The challenge is the comment about microaggressions. As a white person, I'm quite privileged to not face that day after day, hour after hour. And I would encourage all of us to listen to our friends of color and the comments that they get on a daily basis. The story, I, am I close? Need to be closer? Uh, we can't understand what you're saying. Oh, I'll take off the mask. Thank you. Is that better? Yeah, not much. OK. Should I repeat? Yes. OK. I was going to say a challenge and a story. The challenge is the comment about microaggressions. And as a white person and as white folks, we are quite privileged not to face microaggressions, um, especially in Montana. And it would be wise for us to listen to the folks of color as they talk about what they face day after day. The, um, the story is about when I'm traveling, I take pictures, postcards of Montana to help me communicate with people I don't share a language with. I was in Athens, Greece, and in a museum where some people had been very solicitous, and we were making this wonderful connection. So I was sharing postcards, and I thought, well, I'll just, these guys might like this picture of a guy fly fishing. This man who knew 12 words of English said, river run through. <laughs> Yeah, it happens. Uh, that's not the only person uh, who's ever told a story like that. Well, I'm not a social historian or a psychologist, and I can't really make that kind of a connection, except that it's so obvious. You know, that uh, one of the things that they do with uh, uh, juvies is get them out in the woods, uh, call it hoods in the woods, and it, it makes a difference with some people. Uh, how much of a difference, I don't know. Uh, but I think taking kids who are already out here uh, and are spending all their time in the classroom and getting them out of the classroom and into their own environment and introducing them to that and letting them know that there are levels for this. You know, you don't just go out and kick rocks. You can go out and find out about the history of the thing and what it meant to your family, uh, what it means to you, your community, da da da. Yeah, it's a good thing, but as I say, I'm not a sociologist and I would not attempt to go farther than I just did. Okay, um, I have a question that you were talking about paying back and how your family is paying your 
gets to Montana with no. books, and you had a, the whole family books. And I had a question about this one. I guess your son wrote the Paddling the Yukon River. Yes, he did. And um, I, I'm very interested in that since I grew up in Alaska. Uh -huh. And if you can kind of give us a, a little backstory on that. Thank you very much for that question. I'm absolutely delighted to respond. Uh, my son Dan uh, lived in Montana for seven or eight years, uh, went to the University of Montana, uh, got into geology because <clears throat> the geology department at the university here is one of the best in the country. Uh, if you have read the latest edition or even the old edition of Roadside uh, Geology of Montana, it's just magnificent. You talk about getting acquainted with your own, uh, your own community and environment an outdoor community, that's a great way to do it. Uh, he went to work in the oil fields in eastern Montana and then became the only individual we know of who went to Alaska for an improved social life. <laughs> and to get the hell away from the oil business. <laughs> and he worked in the oil business for a while uh, and he wound up being uh, he's now the chief of the uh, science division in Robert Service High School. But when he first got there, he started paddling uh, the Yukon. He paddled the Yukon from Whitehorse to uh, almost to the Bering Sea. You have to get off uh, before you get to the Bering Sea because it takes so long to do that trip that the uh, winter or the late fall, early fall winds are coming in. And if you're paddling solo in a canoe, which he was, you can't make it after a certain point. There's a town where you have to get out now because if you go on, you're not gonna make it. So he did that and then he thought, well, why not do all the trips? So he did all the major tributaries of the Yukon River, one per summer. And as far as we know, he is the only person who has ever done that. Uh, paddled solo, the whole Yukon River and all its trips. He wrote a book about it and it's kind of a guidebook. And for years, it was the number one bestseller in Whitehorse which is the put-in spot. But I talked to him about it a little while ago, and he said, well, Dad, you know, it's been around for 15 years, and after 15 years, a guidebook uh, is out of date. You know, let it go. But it has not been let go, because it isn't just a guidebook. There's an awful lot of personal material in there. And it is part of, I've told him this, it is part of the literature of Alaska. The literature of Alaska is like that. Somebody who went out and did something in a range of mountains and mapped it and explored it that nobody else had ever done. And it reads kind of like a guidebook, but that's Alaska literature. And so it's got a continuing life. He also did the uh, Falcon uh, Paddling Guide to Alaska, and he just got a contract to redo that and bring it up to date. So. He's a wonderful guy, he's got uh, a big family there, a wife and three kids, and he teaches uh, science uh, right up at the foot of the Chugash. He's in Alaska now, John? He is an Alaskan. Oh yeah, yeah, he is a real one. I mean, that he and his whole family are made for Alaska. <laughs> it's what I would have done if I'd had the, had the brains to do it and the brawn. I think we're done. So John, John will be signing books. If you'd like to get a, an autographed book of his books, he'll be doing it up there. And other than that, we, uh, we're going to call this a close. I, <clears throat> appreciate your support efforts, and all the speakers, most of whom have already got the hell out of here. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>